I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for January 23, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Carolyn Larkin, a former Baltimore County Public School student. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is to consider our agenda. Ms. White, are there any ad additions or changes? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to request the removal of item J from tonight's agenda. All in favor of removing item J, please raise your hands. All right, it's unanimous, it's removed, thank you. Now, the amended agenda, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Very good, thank you. Next on our agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed up to three minutes to address the board. Uh, the completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right. The first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight. Ms. Schaefer. Our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Our second is Thor Trevison. 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 Make any effort. The third speaker is Richard Ramsey, or Ricardo Ramsey, if I'm reading it right. Yes. Our third speaker, speaker is Ricardo Ramsey. Our fourth speaker is Aram Abbasi. Our fifth speaker is Ryan Sullivan. Sixth speaker is Tommy Lauren. Seventh speaker is Nicole Landis. Eighth speaker is K. Robasto. Nine is blank. Nine again is Alan Schuster. And our tenth is Melissa McKellen. So our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, uh, we refer your comments to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices, uh, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee related matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, uh, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you uh, see that your time has expired or you, that you hear the bell. Um, so first we will have the advisory and stakeholder group speakers, and our first speaker from TABCO is Glenn Galante. Good evening, Chairman Gillis. Uh, Vice Chairman Stewart, Mrs. White, and members of the board, good evening. Uh, Mrs. Bainton could not be here this evening, so I am going to uh, deliver her remarks. Uh, during tonight's work session, you'll be discussing the upcoming operating budget. Uh, last week, Mrs. Bainton spoke to you about uh, the budget and the money that Mrs. White has put in the budget for increase in maintenance of effort uh, in Baltimore County and how critical that is for us, especially when it comes to staffing, which is much needed, as you well know. Uh, her people, for our people message is the correct message moving forward. 
We again urge you to include those additional positions that have been requested in the budget. We know the budget doesn't address all the issues of much needed staff, but at least it begins to put the right people in the right places. We would like to work with PCPS staff to help formulate future budgets to include additional staff, high school staff, uh, kindergarten assistants, counselors, special ed, teachers, and you know the list goes on and on and on. Addressing class size would also go a long way to help make sure that we have enough people in the right places. For instance, several years ago, the class size average was increased by one or two students uh, in each of the classes at the different levels, and that has created some very large classes, and we all know uh, the best thing for students is small class size and the instruction that's in the classroom. There should be a way to address class sizes, and the way we should do that is to help eliminate some of these, you know, critical issues. The budget that you eventually pass must not only be turned over to the county executive, but also to the county council for review and approval. Uh, but we urge you to push the budget as much as you can to fight for the budget that Mrs. White has put forward, not only for the county council, but also for our state legislators. And your voices cannot be silent, and TAPCO will work with you, alongside you, for that fight, because it's crucial that we get the money that we need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a representative from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. I invite Leslie Weber to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, evening. Vice Chairman Stewart, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee. Policy 1210, Community Involvement Relationship with PTAs will have its first reading tonight. It states that the Board of Education values its relationship with PTAs and PTA Council feels the same. Working together to improve our schools and better the lives of students is a common goal. We're grateful to have met with Ms. White and Dr. Cuellar recently. Dr. Cuellar is our point of contact and we appreciate how responsive he's been. We're excited to welcome him to our board meeting on February 1st. We again invite everyone to our general meeting this Thursday, January 25th at Cockeysville Mill at 7 p.m. Our meeting will feature a presentation by Dr. Laurie Taylor Mitchell, founder of the Lock Raven Network, which is serving homeless and food insecure students at Lock Raven and Parkville High Schools. Dr. Taylor Mitchell will offer practical ideas, such as working with school staff to create a food pantry or room with other necessities to support students in great need. The proposed FY 2019 operating budget will be reviewed tonight. At the January 19th public hearing, we testified about the planned hiring of more teachers, school counselors, social workers, psychologists, behavior interventionists um, as a positive step. We also expressed concern concerned that the hiring of pupil personnel workers was omitted from the budget. More professionals are desperately needed to augment the core of incredibly overworked PPWs addressing the needs of homeless students. We know that Ms. White has made improving school climate a prim priority, but we can't wait until next year to address very troubling behavior problems. In some schools, behavior problems are at crisis levels, and order needs to be restored for the safety of students, teachers, and staff, and to get back to the business of teaching and learning. There need to be consequences, but consequences with compassion. Restorative practices are being used at many schools, which is wonderful, but it's just one tool. We shared with Dr. Cuellar the concept of rapid response, so-called pull-ins, to de-escalate de situations before they get out of control. We're not sure if this approach is being used in BCPS now, but it is working in other districts. Additionally, PTA Council believes that a cell phone policy should be implemented and enforced. Many high school and middle school students are not paying attention in class and are using phones to film fights and other bad behavior. Invasion of privacy is a related issue. We, wel we welcome the chance to work together to address this and other issues facing BCPS. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, Lila Marinbloom. Good, e 
Good evening, Interim Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and Baltimore County Board of Education. I'm here to talk about how educational support staff can better help the students in school. Pictures of our students working independently in small groups on their devices are proudly posted on Baltimore County's website. But what about the students that just don't get it or have given up trying to get it? They are not pictured on our website, but some enterprising students have started to put themselves and their classmates behaving badly on Facebook. You see, one teacher in a classroom may be able to engage 30 or more motivated and capable students, but in the real world, kids come with all types of baggage and disabilities that prevent them from fully benefiting from their, uh, from their classes. A single teacher in a classroom has options to progress the lesson after that first hand is raised. That teacher can either halt the class and attend to the student or defer attending to the student until the assignment has been given out. When kids feel they are falling behind, they start to fall behind. To them, every adult in the room should be a teacher. But when the adult has to back off because they don't have real working knowledge of the device being used, the student sees rejection and defeat. To better engage the entire student population in the classroom, teachers and paraeducators need to be able to collaborate before the student enters the classroom. The best method is through the devices which are being used by everyone in the school except paraeducators. These devices are not just a learning tool for students, but have become the major method of communication in the school. Classroom parents need to know what the teacher is teaching and the best suggested ways to support instruction before they walk into the classroom. In short, the student uses the device, the teacher uses the device. The para who is supposed to help the student should be using the device as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a representative from the Area Education Advisory Council on uh, Northeast, um, and that's Thor Trigvison. Good evening, board members. First of all, uh, Northeast Educational Advisory Board condemns all violence in BCPS schools and on school grounds. The community and its parents should not have to be afraid to send their kids to BCPS school system for education. Yet, we've heard from many parents that are uneasy about sending their children to school, fearing for their safety and well-being at school, desperately seeking out safer options than the BCPS school system. We have heard too many stories from our members of bullying, fighting, intimidation, and harassment. Our parents and community members are fed up with the constant barrage of bad news from the school system. We call on you, our school board, to act on, our, on behalf of our students and parents to combat this continuation of violence and intimidation. This vicious cycle has to stop. Our children are scared to go to school they are tired of being punished as a class for the behaviors of a couple of students. They want and deserve our help. The school staff has often utilized every av avenue available to them to no avail. The behaviors are not changing and in fact seem to be worsening. BCPS administration has to step up and deal with the offenders, not punish the victims. The Northeast Advisory Board calls on you, the BCPS Board, to put additional resource officers at Perry Hall High School, especially at start and release times, one resource officer for over 2,000 students is simply not enough. History has shown that. We call on you to set up an audit of Perry Hall High School security and secu seek improvements with additional video and physical surveillance. Repeated security violations at Perry Hall call for actions from the BCPS board and its administration. We call on on the board to add more pupil personal workers to the school system. Currently there is one PPW serving over 6,000 students in the Northeast area. A total of seven serve over 25,000 students. We call on you to put forth plans to reduce school overcrowding, both short term and long term. And I'll paraphrase a movie line here. 
BCBS, trailers are not an option. To enforce hardship penalties as stipulated by student handbook and where appropriate, commit to prosecutions to the fullest extent of the law. To enforce stricter residency requirements, perform regular audits and frequent checkups for suspected offenders. To enforce stricter zoning policies with fewer transfer ex exceptions. To commit to suspension or uh, to expel students that commit category three offenses. They can be taught from home with their lovely devices supplied by BCPS. To increase transparency in these cases and keep parents better informed. Let's all work together to create. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time for public comment and our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. Um, last time I praised Ms. Cozy and Ms. Miller for what they brought to the table in the past couple of years. And you already heard about bullying. Uh, looking back at the meeting, I think basically the chairs stifling the discussion by Ms. Cozy was not really appropriate. It is really a form of bullying right in, in the board. It's very important for us as board members and community to be open and to have debate, full debate, without anyone trying to put the lid on it. Immoral business behavior starts in the public schools. And we see that in wasting funds. We see it in the news today that is about $147,000 uh, or so. We see it in a hospital throwing a patient almost naked in a cold night and people looking away. And that's really only one case. You would wonder how many people have been mistreated in the same way. And there are really many business leaders that graduate from schools and colleges with the highest degrees and looking really so good in cameras and in interviews, but when they become board members, board of directors and so forth, they look the other way and they really don't do the right thing. So knowing all that, and I believe I told you that before, that we focus so much on math and science and of course English and laptops and so forth. But I really don't see that we focus on ethics. And if we don't focus on ethics, then we have the same 147 thousands that we've seen today uh, on the news. And I really wonder as a public speaker, watching all of you, how many of the contracts that the Board of Education has granted for buildings how many of them are really, truly, and honestly without waste? I really don't know. I'm here really, truly every time, and sometimes I really wonder. So I ask you to be open for debate, and Mr. Chairman, I really ask you not to stifle debate and discussion as was done in the last Board of Education meeting. I know you're trying to kind of focus, but I think we need more debate, not really less. Our next Thank speaker you. is Thor Trigvison. Good evening, board members. Again, I am before you tonight as a concerned father. I am deeply troubled about the continuation of violence at BCPS schools and the inaction of the BCPS board. This was again exemplified last week at Perry Hall High, and by no means do I believe this is the last or this year or probably not the last this month. I don't think it's too much to ask that the board provide safe environment for my children and other children in our school system. So far, the board has remained silent about the incident at Perry Hall High, which I don't think is right. There hasn't even been a condemnation of violence at school or statement issued by the board about the latest case. 
Mr. Gillis and Mrs. White, this is just plain wrong. You as the leaders of BCPS have with your silence become complicit in the attack. I don't know what journey you're taking us on, but I don't know, like where we're heading. My disappointment with how the BCPS leadership deals with violence is palpable by now. I urge the board and especially the interim superintendent White to remove the silk gloves when it comes to violence in schools per category three rules in the student handbook. I call on you, Ms. White, to expel the uh, gun-toting perpetrator from Perry Hall High and ban him from attending the commencement ceremonies, suspend the other individuals who participated in this malicious and heinous act of violence. Ms. White, you need to send a clear signal that this kind of behavior will not be tolerated within BCPS. Ms. White, I hope that you think long and hard about this incident and how it fits into your agenda of improved school environment. I had high hopes for you when you started, but quite honestly by now, I doubt that you are right leader for the BCPS. I think that you have too much baggage to be the leader that BCPS so desperately needs. First it was the ERDI issue, then failure to report that you profited off that, now your lack of reaction to violence in BCPS schools, and I'm not just talking about the latest incident. I don't recall any reaction from you or the board last time a gun was brought to Perry Hall High a few months ago. Mrs. White, I urge you to think long and hard about whether your management style and skills are a true fit for BCPS. I am not, I am, I for one, I am not convinced that you are the right candidate for the permanent position of superintendent on BCPS unless something drastically changes. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Ricardo Ramsey. Ricardo Ramsey. Uh, good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and Board. Uh, my name is Ricardo Ramsey. I'm that mad parent from Woodlawn High School. And tonight, I uh, brought along one of my uh, Make a Difference uh, students. I'd like to also uh, congratulate Ms. White on her award for Voices of Change. I totally dis disagree with that last speaker about you being the right candidate. I truly believe personally that you are that candidate. And I'll let my student introduce himself. And Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pierre St. Louis, and I am currently a senior at Willow High School. The topic for me tonight is the selection of a superintendent for the Baltimore County Public School System. And another topic is of great leaders who is leading great followers to motivate and elevate. It is evident to me that we need a leader that stands for our students. We need a leader who cares for our children. We need a leader that is willing to make difficult and at times maybe not the most popular decision in the eyes of the public. A great leader and superintendent is an instructional leader. He or she knows the most important job of the school district is to make students are learning and achieving at high levels. He or she is knowledgeable of the best practices for maximizing student achievement and is supportive of teachers and the district. I believe great leaders must be able to tolerate frustration and stress. And I also believe that Ms. Valletta White has experienced it all. Going through a Baltimore public school and also working for the Baltimore County Public School Board. It all has done in my view. We need someone who knows our system, knows its communities, and understands its needs and is willing to go to battle for the student's success. We need Valletta White. As future Warrior Online alum, we at Woodland High School welcome a former Warrior alumni in the seat of Baltimore County Public Schools to make a great change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Aram Abbasi. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Aram Abbasi. I am uh, a mother of two beautiful daughters, and I'm also the vice president of PTA at Johnny Cake Elementary School. Um, I want to start with some praises. Um, and the reason why I joined Johnny Cake Elementary School's PTA is because my daughter couldn't start talking about how great her teachers were, and she didn't want to come home from school. And I was like, well, what is it about the school that you like so much? And she told me how her teachers were always uh, appreciative of everything she did. Um, she started learning reading. 
Uh, and then she would come and read to me. So I was like, well, I think I'm going to start coming to your uh, teacher meetings more often now. So she encouraged me to join uh, PTA. Um, and I, when I joined, I didn't realize there were so many uh, stuff, you know, all the stuff that was going on with the school. Um, so I want, I'm here as a concerned parent uh, for the school. Um, we, and I, I want to share some of those concerns with, uh, with the board today and hoping that um, you all can assist uh, with some of the, the, the issues that we're encountering. Uh, but the behavior, the praise also goes to the board and the BC, BCPS team is that the, the, the attitude in the school um, trickles down from the leaders. So thank you all for uh, everything that you do that you know went and was implemented here uh, at my daughter's school, Johnny Cake Elementary. Um, so I want to share uh, our concern of overcrowding. Uh, our school is currently projected, um, or our capacity is 559. Uh, our enrollment, our current enrollment is 730 uh, students. Uh, we have six trailers. Each trailer consists of 30 students. Uh, we have a uh, we don't have any music. We don't have a music uh, room at all. Our music teachers are all on cart, so pretty much they have their all their instruments on a cart, and that cart goes room to room uh, for classroom for for a music class. Uh, our cafeteria runs from 11 to 2, so it's so small that it cannot fit everyone. So. We really would really appreciate that you all come and look at it uh, and look at the the condition on uh, how our, you know how the school is doing its best to accommodate all the kids. Uh, we have five Cal's classes, um, and that's just simply not enough to accommodate. Uh, in the and that that's the only program uh, Cal's uh, and Johnny Cake Elementary is the only program that uh, that school that has that program, um, and I think my time's almost up, so I'll, um, I'll come. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Sullivan. Hello, my name's Ryan Sullivan. I'm representing the Baltimore County Green Party. Um, Thank you to all the speakers that have uh, have already spoke. Uh, many of them, um, are, I'm going to kind of um, just reiterate a lot of what has been already said. Uh, so this most recent incident at Perry Hall High School isn't, as some would uh, claim, enigmatic of an individual failing, uh, nor is the problem that we're too easy on our students who may express raucous behavior. Uh, you know, kids will be kids, especially if they're not properly motivated to um, pursue studies. Uh, in an uh, adequately safe and adequately um, um, engaging environment. Uh, these incidents are merely symptomatic of systematic failures too long unaddressed. I, I want to offer three suggestions to the board that I think will um, significantly um, repair our fractured uh, education system in Baltimore County. Um, we need to build new schools. Uh, Perry Hall High School is about 2,300 that's far too many. Um, it's in many respects an unmanageable community. Um, no matter how many uh, teachers we assign, no matter how many um, uh, social workers, uh, behavioral interventionists, in some respects it's just too big of a community. Um, the second is reduced class sizes. You know, 30 um, uh, to 35 students in a classroom I is far too much. Uh, th there's issues going on in a classroom between electronic devices, between um, different things, uh, you know, that children bring into classrooms from, you know, home, from, from wherever, um, that, you know, a teacher can't really divide their attention uh, that much. Um, and the third thing is that we need more staff uh, trained in uh, moderation and de-escalation uh, and who specialize in social work and behavioral intervention. Um, I, I really do hope that you uh, heed the suggestions uh, I and many other people have laid out and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tammy Larkin. Tammy Larkin.
Good evening. Good evening. I actually don't have a formal statement prepared. I'm here as a Perry Hall mom, a resident of Baltimore County, and a concerned citizen. I'm here because I'm asking that you um, afford parents greater transparency in what's happening in our schools. My daughter, Caroline Larkin, who did the pledge here tonight, was a, gra is a graduate of Perry Hall High School, class of 2016. On her first day of high school, I got the call that no parent ever wants to get, that there was a shooting at her school. There needs to be greater transparency so that parents know what's going on when these types of instance, instances occur. We need um, greater accountability within our schools so that this doesn't continue. We need a stricter enforcement of the policies that are on the books, and we need to, as parents, be assured that when our kids come to school, that they are safe. No mother, no father, no teacher should be put in a situation where they feel that they or their children are not safe. And it seems like such a basic principle that we should have this, but here I sit tonight because this is a pattern of behavior that continues in my schools, in our county schools with our students. And I'm here to ask you to take a stand and say that this is not gonna be the norm, that this is not, that, that this pattern stops tonight, that we say that we have a zero tolerance for this type of violence in our schools, that we want students who are disruptive in our classrooms, that those students will be removed so that our, our children that we send to school have the ability to actually learn and to prosper and to grow. I'm just asking for all of you to consider, you know, our position as parents and, and, and taxpayers that we want you all to do the right thing. We just want you to do the right thing by our kids. And I think it's plain and simple. And again, I, I didn't have any, any planned um, remarks tonight. Um, I wasn't sure I was gonna speak because I've not been feeling great, but I, I really felt very strongly that I needed to take a stand for my community, for my daughter, for my sons, that my son is, is entering Perry Hall High School next year, and I'm terrified about that. And as a parent, I shouldn't have to be worried about whether or not it's safe for me to send my son to Perry Hall High School next year. So I'm asking you all to take a stand and to do something about this. You all are the only people that have the ability to change this. I'm asking you to do what we have asked, what we have put you in this position to do is, is to take a stand for our kids and to stand up for Our next speaker is Nicole Landis. Nicole Landis. Good evening. I thank you for giving me a moment of your time. I'm here on the heels of the last mom that just got up. What's going on, guys? I got a nine-year-old who's suicidal from bullying. I've got a 12-year-old a who was sexually harassed to the point I had to call the MSDE last year, and a high schooler who reported a concealed knife, and it was the school that told my son he could take another ride to school because the student wasn't expelled. What is going on? Our kids are terrified. Our good kids, we need your help. Delegate Muley's here tonight for anyone that's concerned about the Perry Hall High School area. He wants to meet. Us parents are on a move at this point. We're ready to remove our kids from the school. We're calling on you guys to take a stand. Please. Put some corrective action in place and some follow through. More, more ROs in the school, I don't know if that helps or not. Link up with the joins. Do something. If it were your kids, wouldn't you do the same? What do I go home and tell my nine-year-old 
to do every single day when he says he wants to commit suicide because a bully in his class has rights too. He's been threatened with electrocution. He's been threatened with a baseball bat, and he's been punched in the face. While the school administration tells me that this student has rights too. Why does he have rights and my son doesn't? Why is my high school junior coming home terrified to go back to school because a child with a concealed knife, who we don't get to know the consequence of, comes back into school two weeks later and threatens him? Why? It's not just Perry Hall, but it sure starts with what's going on there right now. We want to be able to keep our kids in school safe and productive in the Baltimore County public school system, but we can't do that without your help. I thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Kay Robasto. Kay Robasto. Good evening. Good evening. I didn't expect to be called this evening. Um, I did not have a prepared statement either before sitting here this evening. I'm not representing an organization. I am also a concerned grandparent of a student at Perry Hall High School. I'm here to implore you, the board, to address the ongoing and escalating issues of violence and weapons at Perry Hall High School. I'm asking that you audit the security practice at PHHS and to address the duty of school admin to inform parents and practice transparency in acknowledging issues. Admin appears to be more concerned with the image of the school than the children's safety. Actions have consequences and individuals instilling fear in fellow students should be held accountable. Allowing students to return to school or the student community sends a message that such acts are insignificant. Administrators, when I contacted the school during the um, homecoming incident in October, and I asked if Baltimore County Schools had any type of metal detectors or security measures, that may not be appropriate, but the administrator told me there are no county schools with metal detectors because we don't want children to feel like they're in prison. I don't want my granddaughter to feel like she's in a war zone when she goes to school. She came home afraid at the homecoming of going back to school on Monday. She was at the school over the summer, an unrelated student incident, when the school was threatened. My granddaughter was in school the other day when we had this issue. I'm not sure how many other students are afraid to go to school as well. And I'm asking you, please, to consider whatever policy it is that you have in place at the moment and revamp it so that our kids are not afraid to go to school. It's difficult for teenagers to actually be engaged in classes at this age. They shouldn't be afraid to go to school because that just um, defeats the purpose of being in school and learning. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Alan Schuster. Alan Schuster. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My wife and I moved to Perry Hall about 20 years ago, and one of the reasons that we moved there was because of the schools. Guess what? It's not the same schools, okay? This is getting out of hand. All right, when I was a kid, I saw a lot of fights in school, a couple punches, kids realized it hurt, they stopped, that was the end of it. What I saw on videotape the other day was a beating. That was not a fight. That was a beating, like you see in prison, okay? So Perry Hall is a very middle class, becoming an upper middle class neighborhood. We have houses being built that are 500, 600, $700,000. Do you think people are gonna wanna come to our neighborhood for their children's schooling with this kind of nonsense going on? I certainly wouldn't. I'm a blue collar middle class guy. I became because Perry Hall is an excellent public school. You know, thank God I have one child left who's going to be out in two and a half years if he lives through it. 
I mean, what's, you know, wh and, and what are we saying to our kids when somebody's carrying a replica of an assault weapon and we just say, oh, well, that was a no-no. Oh, it was a no-no. Well, wasn't there a six-year-old that got suspended for school for chewing his Pop-Tart in the shape of a gun? I mean, for God's sakes, I mean, have a sense of priority. You know, and if that, if police had showed up with that replica assault weapon, how would that have gone down? You know, somebody be dead right now. It's just, we need an accounting of who is in these schools, and we need an accounting of where they are from. And we need a zero tolerance policy. When this kind of nonsense happens, they're out. They're going to another school system. When I was a kid, I was terrified by the specter of reform school. Guess what? We tell them, you mess up like this, you're going to a district that's not going to put up with what you're doing. And it's not going to be pretty. And I bet you they'd straighten out really fast. Perry Hall High School has been an example of what is right in Baltimore County. I go to the Saturday night lights of the football game there, I see the cheerleaders, I see the marching band, I see the football team, the kids cheering and screaming. It's great, it's stereotypical high school. I'm not feeling that way right now. We're kind of losing that beautiful stereotypical high school image. And you know, they can do whatever they want to, you know, sweep it under the carpet, but you know what, we got social network nowadays Social media, you know, it's, it's just not going to stay swept. There's just too many eyes, too many ears, you know, too many mouths. And I, you know, I appreciate you folks. Our next speaker is Melissa McClellan. Melissa McClellan. My name is Melissa McClellan. I'm here to speak about Baltimore County Public Schools transportation. Two of my children are enrolled in Baltimore County Schools. Both children have had very serious issues this school year on Baltimore County buses. Most recently, my daughter was called names by her school bus driver. And she was also mocked and bullied by the bus attendant. Our child has special needs. Neither Board of County staff should have bullied and discriminated against our child. She's only 10 years old. Board of County has repeatedly refused to allow us to observe the video, the bus video. Our other child, in September, second day of school, was dropped on, off the side of the road instead of taking him to Orms Elementary to get to his bus stop for magnet school. Recently, I witnessed a Kenwood High School bus. The students were standing, laughing on the bus. The bus was 520. The students threw trash out of the bus and hit another Baltimore County student in the side of the head who's walking down the street, probably leaving from EVT with his book bag on. They were laughing. Was anything done? No, it was swept under the rug as it keeps continual happening. And I'm also on the Baltimore County Transportation Safety Committee. There has not been a meeting since last April. They keep canceling them. There's supposed to be one again next month. I doubt if it happens. There's discipline problems all across Baltimore County. I'm here to, for Baltimore County to provide extension training to Baltimore County bus staff, including for special needs buses. Children are out of control. Drivers need to take control of their buses. Bus personnel need to learn how to interact and treat special needs students, not bully them. Just because my child is making noises because she has autism is not a reason to call her names and mock her and do her growls and her noises back. It's despicable. Please consider that Pathfinders for Autism be included in training bus personnel. It is my understanding that Borma County Public Schools Union has been asking for more extension training for bus personnel, as I've spoken to several employees. Please take this time and provide this training before somebody seriously gets hurt. 
and Mormon County keeps refusing to allow me to see this video that my child was mocked and bullied by a Mormon County, two employees, not one. They call my daughter nasty, ugly, and some other names. Something needs to change in Mormon County. Just a plan needs to be taken care of too. I'm sick of it. Thank you. Our final speaker is, uh, is Delegate Christian Mealy, and uh, the school board is pleased that uh, members of our uh, elected officials uh, come and join us here. And Delegate Mealy, do you want to speak? You won't be heard on the tape, but... Uh, Thank you, Chairman Gillis uh, and board members for uh, allowing me an opportunity to speak. I didn't plan on it. I just wanted to be here tonight as a Perry Hall resident, uh, a new father um, who, uh, who, you know, watching things unfold. Uh, late last week, it was a really sobering uh, thing to see. And uh, to the extent that I've received multiple reports from concerned parents over the last year, I would say, uh, related to bullying, I just felt that we needed to have a conversation about how we move forward. Um, I think the first thing we need, uh, and uh, Board Member Julie Hen has requested uh, regional community forums so that all stakeholders, BCPS board members, uh, TABCO members, principals, administrators, teachers, SROs, police officers, and elected officials can get together and have a conversation as a community. Um, BCPS does a lot of good things, and, it, and it's okay for us as a community to admit when things aren't going so great. We are one of the largest school systems in the United States. It, uh, it, it sometimes can be, be and feel unwieldy, and that's okay, but we need to address this immediately. Um, I echo the comments of the gentleman who said, you know, if the police officers uh, had, uh, had entered the parking lot while the, the, the firearm was being brandished, things could have been terrible, uh, truly awful to even think about that. Um, so I'm also working, actually, I had some legislation drafted today. I'm happy to share with each of you offline, but, um, but basically what it does is it creates a task force on anti-bullying. New Jersey recently did this, and it would bring together all, all the relevant stakeholders that I just mentioned before um, with, with certain goals in mind. One is to have a mechanism whereby the public can be made aware of the incidents of bullying that are, rep that are being reported, and that the public and parents especially would, would get to, um, to look at the disposition of each of those cases to see how these students who are behaving this way are being, um, are being held accountable for their actions. Um, it breaks my heart that, stu that parents are reaching out to me and saying, Christian, uh, my, my son or daughter is terrified to go to school. Uh, the number one thing we need to do as, as elected officials and as school board members is to create an environment for learning that's conducive to academic success. That is the number one reason why we're here. I, I played varsity sports in high school. That's great and everything, but education is first and foremost. If you can't focus on getting a good education because you're terrified of being taken to a bathroom and beat or stomped out on a parking lot with a, with a, a rifle brandished uh, in your face, uh, that, that's hard to, to, uh, to accept. And, I'm one, I want to be a partner. You know, I, I'm not here to point fingers. These things happen across the country. Unfortunately, it happened here in a, in a strong community. But because we're a strong community, I think that we can respond uh, to this effectively. I think we just need to have that conversation in a transparent, public way. And, and I'm happy to be a partner in that respect. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity. And I do plan on you know, sharing my ideas with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Our next agenda item is agenda item F, uh, personnel matters, and I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. <clears throat> I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented in exhibits F1 and 2? Is it? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next on our agenda is uh, consideration of matters taken in closed session. I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Mr. Nussbaum, you have that effect on people. I know, every meeting. <laughs> uh, 
Early this evening, the board considered three matters uh, in regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, one was a continuation of an oral argument that the board heard at its last meeting, uh, and two were considered um, on the record as there was no request for oral arguments made. At this time, it would be appropriate for the board to confirm actions taken uh, in, that, in that closed session in those matters which were uh, hearing examiner number 1746 was the oral argument, and the summary affirmances were 1830 and 1833. Is there a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? And is there a second? Oh, there's no need. To, oh, yeah, a second. Second. All right, now, Mr. Virch. Uh, Mr. Gillis, uh, the one item, as I had previously indicated, I can't participate in, but the other two items I certainly can. 1746, who is abstaining from 1746? That's the matter that came up from last week. That's Mrs. Miller, Mr. Stewart, Mrs. Eaton, and Mr. Virch. Um, we'll do that one separately. All in favor of 1746, uh, please say aye. 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 All right, that carries. Now, 1830 and 1833. Three. All in favor of those, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm All right. abstaining from that, those two as well. All right, and there's two abstaining from that, Mrs. Causey and Mrs. Miller. And as always, the orders are on the desk for signing later. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Uh, next on our agenda is item H, and it is uh, work session report on policies, and I invite Mr. Virch to take charge. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the uh, board, of our board, the uh, Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that our board accept this report of the Policy Review Committee's approved proposed amendments to the following board policies for first reader. One, policy 1210, relationship with parent, teacher, Student Associations. Two, Policy 3125, Student Activity Funds. Three, Policy 3160, Review and Approval of School Sponsored Activities. And also for first reader, the proposed deletion of the following board policies. Uh, for Policy 3530, uh, Safety and Security. Uh, policy 5330, <coughs> Social Events. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Board Exhibit H. Thank you, Mr. Verst. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of uh, the Board's Policy Review Committee, which is the f introduction of these first reader items? There's no second needed. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that carries. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Next on our agenda is item I, work session. Uh, that is the work session on fiscal year 2019 operating budget, and I invite Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantleff to come forward. And Mr. Chair, while they're coming forward, I just would like to say again that how excited we are to put forward this budget proposal. Again, the theme of the budget is people for our people um, because we are in a people business. And so we respect the fact that we cannot do this job without building relationships with our students. And so we do respect the fact and we're excited to um, put forth a budget proposal that champions that. The um, budget that you have before you, again, focuses on four priority areas of this administration, and that has to do with special education and ESOL. It also um, focuses on growth and infrastructure, as well as literacy and school climate. Uh, so uh, all of those uh, priorities are so very important to us. We did receive um, hundreds of questions from the board, so we thank the board for those questions. You have those answers in writing, and the um, answers that we received um, by Tuesday have been are posted right now online for the public. So again, we invite Mr. Smith, Mr. Sayers, and Dr. McComas um, to offer any clarifying um, information um, for the board uh, related to those questions. Thank you, Ms. White. Mm -hmm. Mr. Smith. Mr. Sayers' show. Mr. Sayers. Dr. Hello. McComas. Um, Good evening. As the Mrs. White said, you have a lot of material in front of you, but I uh, wanted to focus on this work session document uh, that's also uh, been on the website and just walk you through uh, some of the finer points uh, in the uh, first four pages. Uh, page one shows a roll up of the $1.7 billion operating budget, uh, which is $1.9 billion for all funds. The general fund contains uh, 
most of our regular operating expenses and is mainly funded by state and county revenues. The special revenue fund contains our restricted grants, the two largest of which are the federal Title I and IDEA special education programs. The capital, budget, uh, capital projects fund includes the board's capital funding requests uh, that are now pending before the State Board of Public Works and Baltimore County government. The debt service fund is required for reporting purposes to reflect the payment of interest and principal on um, long-term debt obligations uh, for which the uh, Board of Ed is not liable, uh, but which is required here for reporting purposes. The enterprise funds includes all of the financial activities of the food and nutrition program and the internal service fund accounts for workers' compensation claims. Uh, at the bottom of page one, you'll see an enrollment chart which reflects the 1% increase over uh, FY18 um, of 100, of uh, 100, 1,143 students. Enrollment is projected to increase by another 1,188 students in next September and by 6,400 students over the next 10 years. Page two is our maintenance of effort summary. A maintenance of effort is the state law requiring uh, mandatory local county funding for education. Appropriated per pupil funding levels in any year must be maintained in subsequent years. With permission from MSDE, one, certain one-time expenses uh, such as computer system upgrades, uh, new schools, startup costs, um, and some equipment may be excluded from this maintenance of effort calculation. Uh, for FY 2019, the proposed budget includes $10.3 million in one-time expenditures. You will see, uh, looking at the chart, uh, the history of maintenance of effort since 2005, uh, in some years we have, uh, county funding has exceeded maintenance of effort. In some years, it has uh, simply been at the minimum level, particularly in, uh, re in years in which the re impact of the recession was felt. Uh, this year, uh, the superintendent's proposed budget requests 7.5% over maintenance of effort funding. That equates to $58.9 million. And mainly to support employee compensation. As we uh, state every year, uh, this particular proposed budget uh, is comprised of over 82% salaries and benefits. Um, there's also a summary showing the composition of state county revenues. Uh, Baltimore County uh, is proposed to provide 54.9% of our general funds next year with 43% coming from state revenues and 2.1% from other sources such as tuition, interest, out-of-county living placements for non-resident children, et cetera. On page three, there is a uh, pie chart at the bottom of the page which shows all of our general fund expenditures uh, categorized uh, according to MSDE uh, chart of accounts and standards. And page four uh, is uh, our lists all of the uh, separate requests categorized by the four focus areas that the superintendent mentioned, special education and English learners, growth and infrastructure, literacy, and school climate. There's a page number by uh, each of the items on that summary page, and the details are referenced in the remaining uh, pages 5 through 18 of this work session document. I'll also mention that on page 14 is the stat worksheet, fi financial worksheet that we update annually. And uh, I'll just ask that if you have any clarifying questions or follow-up questions to those already provided that we uh, you, uh, ask them now. Thank you, Mr. Saris. I, I will, um, on behalf of the board, uh, thank um, Mrs. White, Mr. Smith, you, uh, Dr. McComas, and others for all the hard work you've done in putting together written responses to the questions that have already been placed online. Um, 
and I know that was a, a, a substantial task, so uh, we thank you for that. To the extent that there are questions that board members have uh, that either are new questions or are clarifications of the answers that have already been given, this is a great time for board members to ask those questions. So um, open it up. Mrs. Miller. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for all the work that you've put in. I know this is a hard process all around, including for the board members. Um, I do have some clarifying questions. We just received the answers last night, so I was not able to go through all of the answers. Um, so I, I'm going to get as far as I can. I'll be a little discombobulated, but I, I do want to submit some more follow-up questions, and, and I wanted to ask our chairman what that process is. Could we consider follow-up questions to be submitted through the weekend? Please do that. If you'll submit questions to uh, Mrs. White by, by the end of Day business night. on Friday, uh, um, as we did last time, by Friday, and I'll send an email to everyone to remind you, by close of business on Friday so that mm -hmm. there can be an opportunity for the system to work on that so they can have, quest so they can have answers posted again because this is scheduled for uh, discussion and vote on February 6. Would it be possible for the board members to um, be able to make use of the weekend since it's unlikely that the staff will be working on answers over the weekend? Um, we have, it, have them submitted by Sunday night? Um, well, I guess the answer is yes, yeah. um, uh, because whenever you submit them, we're, the, um, I believe the administration is going to try to answer them. The sooner you get them, the more likely they're going to be able to be answered and posted online. Do you have more? So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Ms. Miller, to, your, to answer your question. We certainly want to give you enough time to formulate your questions, and we also need time to respond. So, um, certainly by Sunday evening or by noon on Monday would be absolutely kind of drop dead deadline for us so that we have some time to formulate the answers. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, in looking at the budget book, I, it does look like that in a number of ways, um, prior comments and, and public comments have been taken into consideration, and I appreciate seeing that responsiveness, particularly with regard to um, special ed, teachers or, or staff and school counselors. Um, so I appreciate that. I do have some follow-up questions, and I, I'm just going to try to get to where I need to be. Um, if you just bear with me a, a second here. Okay. Um, if you're going to submit these questions, we're not going to have I have some clarifying questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, one of my questions was about uh, one-time tech-related expenditures. Um, that's shown on page 19. Um, I, the answer I received what, was that there were $400,000 um, of one-time funds for the replacement of old fiber optic cabling. But when I looked, what I was referring to was how the inst other instructional costs category had increased by 14 million. And, and it was my understanding just, or my assumption, that that was one-time funds that had been moved from the admin category. Is that correct? Because no, there was a decrease in the, in the admin category and an increase in the other instructional costs. So what page are you referring to? Um, I had written down page 19. Okay. So in the past, I've raised the issue about the admin overhead um, being very large and increasing yearly. And I was told in previous years that the reason, part of the reason that the admin category on page 19 here was so big in, in previous years was that there were one-time uh, tech-related expenditures. Uh, I'm looking at the budget book, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I'm looking for the answer or the response that we prepared uh, for that question also. Um, so let, give me a minute to find that. 
page. Three. No, I guess the first question is, is my assumption correct that the reason admin is lower this year is that those, uh, those tech-related expenditures that had been in that category have been moved to other instructional costs? Okay, well, you got it on three. Yeah. I, I want to give you the answer that we provided. Um, so um, I'll refer to page three, uh, mm -hmm. your question three, um, and I'm going to just uh, read this answer. Prior to STAT, computers for schools were charged to instructional tech textbooks and supplies because they were purchased and not leased. A reduction of 3.5 million in instructional textbooks and supplies took place between FY14 and FY15, and another $4.5 million reduction in instructional textbooks and supplies has taken place since. Uh, these decreases took place over multiple years um, and due, due to uh, offsetting increases from other curricular materials. Okay, and the reason that confuses me is that you reference, other, you reference instructional textbooks and supplies, but my question was about other instructional costs, which increased by 26.4%. Uh, the primary the reason for that is be, it relates to this answer. Um, when technology, particularly devices, was purchased, it was uh, an instructional textbook and supply. And when those uh, equipment were leased, that, be, that put it into the category of other instructional materials. Okay, so what had been in instructional textbooks is now in other instructional costs. Correct. Okay. So the administration category only went up 1.3%, where it had been going up, uh, I think, in double digits. I don't recall offhand for the past couple of years. So what accounts for that change in the administration category? The increase of 1%? Yeah. I mean, why is that so and different than what it's been? Is that on page 19? That of the is, of the budget document? book. That's the executive summary. Well, uh, that is primarily salaries. Um, there really are no other increases in that category. Okay, so the tech related expenditures that had been in that category in previous years are no longer there. No, all of the the only change in classification that I that I'm aware of is the shifting of technology from activity four to five. There's no change in the technology supported by administration this year. Okay. Well, all right. We'll try to get at that at, <laughs> through follow up questions, I guess. Um, let me let me move to another one. Um, now I had I had asked um, a question for um, Ms. White to answer, which there was an answer provided, and the question was: In your professional opinion, is the STAP program financially sustainable in the long run, or are we setting our school system up for a financial disaster down the road that different leadership will have to deal with? Um, and to summarize the response, it was that Baltimore County was supporting the program and it was built into the MOE. So the response was, yes, it is um, sustainable. So my follow-up question is, does the sustainability then require the support of Baltimore County? So I'm wondering if, if Baltimore County takes a different stance on this, we're going to have new leadership. Um, because we have had, a, a, let's say, a lukewarm ability to show improvements in students' outcomes, or for whatever reason, if their support would change, how is that going? I mean, how could we get out of STAT? I mean, we're kind of stuck in STAT. Well, we're, we're not necessarily, I mean, I, I think the categorization is a little bit different. The county has assured the level of maintenance of effort, which is inclusive of the entire budget 
up to and including stat. So um, the, if the maintenance effort, the maintenance of effort cannot go lower than what it is currently in the year that we're in. So mm -hmm. the categories in which that comes in is not necessarily um, per se dictated by the county. It's the superintendent's budget that's recommended by the board and approved by the board to go to, this, to the county executive and then ultimately to, count, to the county council. So the maintenance of effort is really the, the guiding principle there as it relates to what the minimum level of, of required funding for both state and local. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I had asked what is the estimated range in cost for the upcoming new contract for devices? So we're gonna be rolling out to all the high schools um, and I'm assuming that some amount must have been allotted in this budget. Is that, uh, can you tell me where that is and how much was allotted for that? I mean, I know at this point it's guesswork, but there, there would have had to have been something earmarked. We've, we've stuck with the financial plan that's on page 14. So the previous year's budget and the proposed budget for FY19 for STAT has not changed, and that is the the proposed budget for that expenditure. Of the right, the, the of page the fourteen other. that we're referencing uh, explains the rollout costs for all of the all of the years related to through through twenty twenty. The budget is reflected of that. So this request here is the final phase of that rollout, and that's what that is. So it is inclusive of whatever that active this, this. that active solicitation is on the street. So that that's why um, we use the pro forma information that's there. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I was a little confused by this document. It's very detailed. Thank you for that. Um, so on the right hand side it says grand total one time cost. This is um, on page 14 of the supplementary, I don't know what you called it. What did you call this book? Well there's a work this session document. The work session is document. That it? And that what page? Page, that page, page oh. 14 where it's this, it shows the, it says budget focus area literacy, mm -hmm. but this is the STAT program. That's correct. Um, so it says grand total one-time costs on the right-hand side, and then there's a bunch of costs. But I wasn't sure what the total of those was. And then grand total ongoing costs, and underneath of that, it shows $257 million. In, in a subsequent cut question in, in the ones that were submitted, that question is answered. It, it tells what the total amount relative of the cost of the program to date Plus, this, this form here tells you what the out years are for through 2020. And once again, the updated information cannot be provided until we get um, the, f the best and final from the solicitation that's on the street now. So we, you can't necessarily... Two devices. Right. So we, we've estimated based on the current projections that we have now. Okay. So where is the estimate for the new devices in, on this page? Well, there is none. We have the budget for new to, for the FY19 installment is ten point uh, four million dollars, and that hasn't changed. So it's possible w until we complete the RFP and the board makes the award, we won't have a uh, a price to give you. But we've budgeted based on our current costs. Which so is inclusive of a four-year rollout of a lease program. So the, the lease program, the, the 56 some odd million dollars that is on page 14, that is the rolling cost of the program over four years. So that is part of, if, if, if approved in this budget, the final phase of that, which is the 10.3 or 10.4 million dollars, is inclusive of maintenance of effort. So as the new lease comes online, the associated dollars to that uh, renewal of that lease are already embedded in the, in the existing budget if approved for FY19. So your answer to my question about the projected costs just, you know, of STAT um, was uh, shown on this document, plus you referenced that there were some software license fees that 
are not in the stat budget but are in the Department of IT, but you didn't give me an amount there. Is that whatever is through the Department of Instructional Technology, is that in, are those numbers accounted for on this sheet or are they not included? Are you referring to a specific question or that you? The way that this, I, I can't, you know, I can't refer back and forth. Okay. It's, it's too hard to do while we're sitting here. So the items that are included uh, in this plan uh, show uh, costs for uh, the classroom, for the libraries, for staff, for student devices, which is by far the largest uh, cost. Uh, web hosted uh, content, the um, Microsoft licensing fees, the cost of BCPS1 and uh, related software, cost of professional development, and uh, curriculum. Okay, and, so. And all of those total the number that I think you cited over um, the five year now. Uh, plan 257 million point six and that includes software licenses correct all the software licenses this is everything okay that, that's why I want to know so the one that says if I may just interrupt for a second to help mr. Saris on page four of your questions and answers questions three and four I believe are the questions that um, are being discussed now if that's correct correct okay so where it says one-to-one -one student initiative, that section, that's the devices, and it shows 183 million being allotted for that. So uh, that's over five years, correct? Okay. And we've currently, and um, your question four on page four, we've spent to date 147.7 million. Okay, but but on this. It shows total costs from 24 to 2018 of being 257 million. That's the five-year cost, correct? Of 2014 to 2018. To 2019. Well, it says 24 to 28. It says 14 to 18 on this document that we've spent 257 million so far. It looks like the first year of the plan is 2014, and the last year of the plan is 2019. There's five years, I think, listed. Okay, I'm, I'm just referring to what it says over on the left hand. Total cost 2014 to 2018. So you're saying it's through 2019? Yes. Okay, so 257 million, not the 147 right. That's million. That's an error on this spreadsheet. On the spreadsheet, on page 14. Yeah, it should say 2014 through 2019. Okay, but it's 257 million. Correct. It's, it's about two-thirds of the way down where it says total costs. So it's not 147 million like the answer. It is 147 million. Then why does it say 215? Okay. Okay. All right. So the allotment for devices is 183 million. And so if the new contract comes in higher than that, then that'll be over and above what was budgeted. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, why don't you come back to me while I... Very good. Thank um, you. Uh, we've been going about 15 or 17 minutes and Mrs. Miller needs a break. Anyone else have any questions? Mrs. Causey. Dovetail a bit on this line of questioning related to. Uh, Turn on your mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To dovetail on this line of questioning related to STAT or technology okay. initiative, um, the question was asked about the RFP for devices. Um, how many devices are currently being requested on that RFP? I believe 32, approximately 32,000, Mr. Brown, is that correct? Okay, and then <clears throat> this, on page 14 of the um, operating budget work session document, mm -hmm. 
Um, it goes up, as you mentioned, through 2018, 2019. I had requested to see what the next five years estimate is going to be. Is there a document that reflects that? There's not such a document. Okay, so has this document been reviewed with the county leadership and the county council? Of course it has, yes. Okay, and but not any document that reflects the future? Because we don't, we don't know what, there's, what those costs are, so the assumption is the costs are gonna be in line with what we have now, below or higher. At that point in time, we'll have to have additional conversations with the superintendent or the board or whatever, but it, we don't know that until the actual contract comes forward with pricing. And you're talking here about devices. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, and this spreadsheet, though, considers a great deal more things than just the devices, although the devices do um, eat up the majority of the funding in the year to year and also in the total. Um, when is the time frame that you would expect the RFP um, to be ready to come to the board? It's coming March 6th. March 6th. And I had asked what is the estimated range in cost for the upcoming new contract. The answer that was given is the best and final offer will be determined when the RFP is awarded, um, which of course is logical, but the bids are already in. So you must have a range of, are we looking at anything potentially less expensive? Um, we, we have to be careful because we're in, the, we're in the middle of an active procurement. So if we give ranges, individuals could determine what, who that is. So we just, we need to be careful about, that's why we tried to answer it as, as, as transparent as possible, but we're in the middle of an open compete. And so uh, what I would say is um, the current um, ranges that we are um, uh, evaluating are, are not far off of what the estimate that we have now, so that it wasn't one that we needed to adjust or increase our estimate. We're just basically saying it seems to be in line, but we don't, we can't really say that until one is awarded and best and finals are determined. Okay. Um, did, and also, did I, did I, did I? Yes, thank okay. you for that. Um, was any consideration given to comments that were made multiple times during board meetings to consider a more simple device for the younger students? I'll let Dr. Yeah, Boswell so. come. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Ms. Causey. Um, to answer your question, um, we uh, included a total of 345 people um, in focus groups to provide feedback on what um, specifications, uh, needs that we had for the device, uh, devices to use. Um, 234 of those um, individuals were teachers, uh, 111 were students. Um, and um, some of the features that um, came out of their feedback was, um, I gotta read my own writing here, uh, of course instructional use, um, and we know that um, there's a significant difference in, in uh, technology that can support production and creation versus just a sort of um, a more simple use, you know, oftentimes we think of entertainment use versus production use. Um, USB screen size, touch um, technology capability, um, the sturdiness, um, I can't read my own, my first note on my handwriting, sorry. <laughs> I'll chime in here as well. Um, that I also hold, um, I, and thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. McComas, for that. I also have teacher advisory and principal advisory uh, groups as well. And I asked this question very um, pointedly. And our teacher advisory group told us about the, the need, their need, to be able to have students consume information and to be able to produce information from, again, from elementary through the high school level. So some of our elementary teachers were very vocal about the need to have uh, a device where they can do both. Our, um, our parent advisory group um, also talked about the need for students. They said, you know, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We have to um, be champions of some of the basic skills that, that kids need. So our parents said that they want our kids to learn 
at the elementary level, they talked about keyboarding skills. They talked about the use of Word. They talked about all of those um, uh, applications that are in the Microsoft Office kind of suite. And so that they want us to have even a more intense focus um, on those efforts, particularly at the elementary level. So again, that ability, it's not just where we could have a, a, um, a lesser device at the elementary level, say a, just a tablet, for instance, because they need to be able to consume and produce information from elementary through K through 12. And, and Ms. Causey, the, the written response, because I know that was a lot that was said, the written response is, is in the packet two, questions two, it's on page four A. So it, that, that's there so you can refer to it at a later date. So I know that we hit through a lot of stuff at the end. I don't want you to feel like we didn't respond to it in writing. So. Right, that's great. And also I do think it's important that even though there are written responses, that uh, this is the forum to have all the board members hear the same information, for our community to hear it, mm -hmm. um, and then for us to d d have discussion about it. And our chair is going to be asking us questions later so um, about what we uh, think about the budget. Um, so I appreciate that while we do have a lot of information written, some of it is still good to go over in the open meeting. Um, uh, getting to your timeline answer of March 6, um, it um, doesn't quite line up with the board's work efforts in terms of um, voting on February 6 to send an operating budget to the county, a, a budget that the board feels uses the resources in the best efforts for our students' instruction. So if it's the case that we do uh, come in at a lower cost um, than having to spend uh, $51,883,000 in leases for fiscal year 19, one of my questions is, would the board be able to put in um, amendments of if there are savings, where else we would like that money to go? In, in ahead of time rather than waiting until the May timeframe when it goes through the county council and then it comes back to us. So what, what mechanism would there be? And if you don't have an answer, then it's maybe something to consider and to get back to us. Because one of the things that we have heard here tonight and consistently since I've been on the board is to move further in the direction that Ms. White is moving the system now, which is the right direction in my opinion based on what I've heard over two and a half years from, um, from our key stakeholders and our parent stakeholders, um, which is the people for our people. So I would like us to think about that because there are a number of um, questions that came in from community members and key stakeholders, including TABCO, ESPBC, um, CASE, PTA County Council, and others, um, talking about still increased needs for pupil personnel workers. We heard that tonight with our um, very concerned parents um, around school climate, which is one of our focuses. Um, so I would like that timing to be considered um, around if there is any possibility in uh, spending less money on the devices in the future years. So I guess my other question is with the stat spreadsheet not moving forward in time, um, you know, we're kind of making a, another big leap with outfitting now 21 additional high schools, um, finishing, rounding out the middle schools, um, and then refreshing the teacher devices. So we're, we're here making another leap without having those next steps in front of us. What that budget refresh is going to be for some of these other items on on the stat. So is that anything that the system is working on? When you say we're making the next leap, um, with the request that is forward to us tonight, it is inclusive of what we think the ongoing costs will be. We just don't have best and final related to those numbers. So um, to your point earlier, if it's an up or down, we'll, we'll, we'll have that in due cause, but the estimate or the budget that's presented to you now um, takes an account for what the current um, stat program is and what will happen in the future is it's a rolling lease. So when the last piece comes in, comes in then the, the, the total cost of the stat program will be inclusive through FY19. So it's just, it's part of maintenance of effort. So it's just like we have with teachers or other materials and supplies that we have that are part of the, the ongoing budget. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. Um, as you said, there's a lot of information, and anyone that wants to can go online and see the questions that were asked and the answers that were provided. Um, I wanted to shift a little bit to a report that was sent to me from the Maryland State Board of Education by one of our um, key stakeholders. And the, the question that's in front of it is, I see a concerning trend in this report. And I'm wondering, number one, as a board, are we aware of this? Is interim superintendent aware of this? And if so, are there any plans or should we have a plan um, to, to bring this more in line? And one of the, the report is from the Maryland State Board of Education, and it is the analysis of professional salaries of Maryland public schools dated October 2016. And I did send this to all the board members and the interim superintendent and key staff um, in an email. So they do have that to reference. Uh, but one of the concerning trends is that while we in Baltimore County Public Schools, our salaries relative to the state average in some areas are, are above state average, and but in many areas are below state average. And the trend that I see is that we're above state average when it comes to central office and administrators, but we are below state average when it comes to teachers, um, therapists, guidance counselors, um, librarians. Can I ask you a question about? Can I ask you a question about their report? Sure. Does that report include benefits as well, or just a basic? Is salary? your mic on? Uh, yeah, it's on. Okay, it's lit up. Good. It was. Does that does that report include benefits or just basic salary salaries, whatever they may be, whatever step they are, and so forth and so on. Okay, so um, it's the report is prepared by MSDE based on the information submitted. Salaries include annual pay for 10, 11, and 12 month full time and part time positions shown. All data reflects the conversion of part-time employees to full-time equivalents. Um, they don't mention here in benefits. I do notice from our uh, salary that was represented for the superintendent that it is not inclusive of benefits, but you can certainly go online and see if they have additional notes as, as to that. Um, but again, my, my, my concern is that for the um, folks that touch the students every single day that they are below average in state pay. Um, and, you know, while some of our um, central office people are in are much higher um, than state average. So the former superintendent was $287,800, while the uh, state average was $205,000. Um, and that's, that is the base salary for ours, because I know that because of the contract. But in any case, I'm curious if the rest of the board was aware of that or if the interim superintendent is aware of that. And I'd like to have that as an item to discuss because I think when we talk about these incredibly dedicated folks that love these kids, they're in the classroom, they're in the counseling rooms, um, that we really need to uh, reflect that in their salary. And being one of the um, wealthier counties in the state, um, I don't see why that should be that we're below average for these very key personnel. So thank you for raising that. I, again, I, I believe that we have the hardest working teachers in the country. And so we, we do make sure, need to make sure that they are compensated uh, accordingly. And if you take a look at the budget, especially with growth and infrastructure, we appreciate um, Baltimore County's commitment to increase, um, not only you know this, do the step increases, but we're looking at cost of living increases, which accounts for a, a great deal of this budget request to make sure that we're getting our teachers closer um, to their colleagues throughout the state. M much of what you're looking for is central office, and certainly we can research this, we're looking at years of experience and expertise, um, which will also um, contribute to a higher sal salary at central level because many times you're talking about more seasoned personnel um, and more degrees and more levels of expertise in, in some cases. Um, but again, we want to make sure that the majority um, of this budget, if you take a look, and I'm not sure, George, where it shows the pie chart. It's page six in the work session. Um, right, so if you take a look at page six, you'll see the pie chart 
the, the two green areas there, that's the majority of this. Uh, the, that would account for about, George, correct me if I'm wrong, about 5% over MOE in itself, right? Correct. Um, that would just account for the cost of living in increases as well as the fringe benefits. So, d so was there an awareness? You said we're getting close to the state average, so we will be closer. Yes, every year we're getting closer. Okay, that's very good to hear. So, and thank that's you been that. a product of the the most recent three-year contracts of the two, two, two for 17, 18, and nine, and proposed for 19 for the bargaining units. That's um, certainly all all in line with what the superintendent is referring to. Okay, and one of my other questions, which um, I did not have the time to review in all of this uh, was the county has seen the whole budget and has agreed to the seven and a half percent maintenance of effort? The county is in the process of looking at all of the county departments and those budget requests that are coming in. So certainly we have constant communication with our county officials, but n nothing has been approved at this point. They're still considering it. This okay. is the recommendation from the superintendent to the Board of Education, which will ultimately move forward on the end of this month, the end of February to the uh, county executive. That's right. The first step is here. We would never get in front of the Board of Education. Okay, thank you. And I will take a break for a moment. Very good. Mr. Yulfelder. I wanted to comment on what the report that Mrs. Causey has. Uh, MSDE also puts out a, another report on salaries, and it, it, they do it by uh, LEA and the number of students in each LEA. And um, the last time I looked at it, now I don't have a current one, but the last time I looked at it, uh, I don't think we were at the bottom of the chart. Um, there are other considerations. Uh, depending on where you live in the state, your cost of living is certainly different. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, you have to find out whether uh, what the benefits are. You have to find out uh, what the uh, system pays for relative to continuing education, to cohorts. There are a lot of benefits, and they're not reflected in that report. That's a raw salary. That's all it is. So, you know, you got you to see what else is offered in order to find out whether we're very competitive. Apparently, we are very competitive because we don't lose anywhere near the number. We're losing about 2% of our teachers a year, the last number I looked, and I think that's far below the state average. So I see Mrs. Miller has her hand raised, but before we go back to Mrs. Miller, are there others that have not yet had an opportunity to ask questions who have a desire to Seeing none, Mrs. Miller, it's back to you. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions that I'm not sure were answered yet or not, but they were important. I just want to run it by you. Uh, the general fund balance has been dwindling steadily each year since FY16. At the current rate, we will have basically a zero balance at the end of FY20 in another year. What is causing this trend and how are you expecting it to change? I don't know if I understand the question. The general fund? Yes. So fund I think balance. it's. Oh, the fund page balance. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, the. Um, as, as we. Um, continue to squeeze every um, line item down to the minimum amount of funding required. Um, we, we have shrunk, uh, we have not added to fund balance uh, as dramatically. And we, every, really several times a year, we uh, we report that information uh, to our stakeholders, to county government, and they're well aware of, since the fund balance is managed by county government, they're well aware of the, of the resources that are there and the projected <clears throat> path. And um, so we feel we've done uh, everything fiscally responsible to make that uh, known. Okay, so if, it, if it's known, doesn't solve the problem though. Are you expecting that to change? Because we don't want to be, I think you had told me maybe two years ago that the desired fund balance is something like 18 million, something like that. 
You had given me an estimate of a desired or an optimal fund balance. Three to five percent is a good range, okay. targeted range. Yeah, and so we're going to be below that. We're going to be almost down to zero. So what's going to turn that around? I mean, we can't go negative. Well, the, what's going to happen after well, 2020? The, the fund balance is not something that we necessarily can keep. It's the fund balance. It rolls over to the county. Um, it's, it's, we have to return all the fund balance back. What we have to do is make sure that we report what the projections are so that if, if fund balance is less than it was in a previous year, the, the county support will have to be inclusive of whatever it's deficient in one way or the other. Our responsibility is to make sure that that's not a surprise as we move through each successive um, budget process. And we do that um, with, with the superintendent, with this board, and the CE and the, and the council by providing the documentations as it relates to what the estimated fund balance is and what will or may not be available for the next budget cycle. So if, if our current programs, system needs require that we dip into our general fund balance at the current rate that we have been, and I don't have the number in front of me, so that it would leave us with a zero balance in another year, you know, after by 2020, we're going to have to make an adjustment to what we're doing. Well, the maintenance of effort uh, laws address that particular issue of local education funding. Well, that doesn't mean they're going to give us more. I mean, the fund balance is just whatever we didn't lose the prior, use the prior year. But, so but if the, we're using the fund our prior is not, years. They don't necessarily give us a fund balance. The fund balance is we, we make an estimate each year of what we think the fund balance is going to be at the end of the year. Some, some years we're, we come in more than that. Some years we come in less. What the county has to, has to be made aware of is our estimates are not necessarily you know, you know, they're, they're an estimates, and those estimates, we we're, we're able to track them pretty closely. They have to know in their programming that the levels of fund balance may go up at some time and down at some time, and depending on which year it is, they'll have to account for that in the local share related to the, the total budget allocation that we receive. So do you acknowledge that we will have to make an adjustment to this level of spending that we've been doing? in order not, to avoid that. I do not make that acknowledgement. E each year, the level of fund balance fluctuates. We put an estimate in based on what we think it's going to be, what, what we think that can be used in the, in the following. For example, in the FY19 budget, we estimated $27 million. We're seeing $27 million of, of existing fund balance will be made available for next year's budget. That number could be more, that number could be less, but the county has to, has to make whole whatever that number comes in at based on the estimate and how that fund rolls. Okay, I'm not understanding how this is going to resolve itself by 2020, but I'll try to absorb what you said okay. and do follow-up questions on that. Certainly. Um, another important question let me find it. School-based budgets, excluding salaries and wages, which are governed by the master agreements, have dropped dramatically by over 40 percent since FY14, while the number of staff and students have grown. This decrease coincides with the cuts that were made to system programs and budgets in order to pay for STAT, those 500 programs that Dr. Dance spoke of cutting to pay for stat. Could be wrong. Yeah. Since last year, school-based budgets dis decreased another 12 percent. When is that trend going to turn around? And how are schools managing with such deep cuts to their budgets? How are these cuts justified? So that re our written response is on page 10, question number 57. Um, this is the FY19 proposed budget is the last year of the planned redirect funding from school and office budget. 
uh, prior to FY15 and STAT implementation, schools were responsible for purchases of computers, printers, copiers, toner, uh, curriculum, et cetera. Uh, and so those resources have now been <clears throat> centralized and um, for example, schools used to also pay for graduation ceremonies. Those are also now centralized. And so uh, also <clears throat> on page 14 of the work session document, we summarize the uh, redirected funds um, in a purple line titled BCPS budget realignment. And uh, as, we, as we show here, 2019 will be the last year so that there's no continuing trend okay. beyond next year. And is that because we'll have purchased the devices, that, that'll be over, so the, the thrust of the cost will, will kind of level out, and so right. we can expect that school budgets will then be able to recover after, S school the, after budgets, this um, coming year? School will remain the same. We, f we adjust based on enrollment every year. So they go up as enrollment goes up. Um, um, yeah, I don't have my spreadsheet on that one open at the moment, but um, hold on, I think I got it. School-based budgeting, okay. So, um, Well, the totals, if you discount salaries, okay, because we don't have control over that, um, for the other categories, the contracted services, the supplies and materials, other charges and equipment, uh, the totals have been going down since t uh, FY14. Um, if they were going up, that's due to salaries. So if we discount salaries and just look at the rest, they've been going down. Uh, they were 20 million in FY14, then the next year 19 million, the next year 15 million, the next year 14 and a half, the next year 14, and for FY19, 12 million. Is that school budgets? That's school budgets minus salaries. Okay. Um, so we're looking at another, like I said, another decrease of 12% out of those categories. Um, so they're, they're suffering. I mean, they're, they've so been- as I, under, as I understood the answer, there are lots of expenses that used to be in the school-based budgets that are now absorbed in the administration budget. So there's less that the school-based budget needs to spend. So there should be less. Well, yeah, and we've been hearing that for the past few years, um, and that has not been without its own set of problems. Um, but I am glad to hear that that will begin to change after another year. So uh, school and office expenses are going down um, by 460,000 between this year and next year, and that's the last planned adjustment. Okay. Um, I have some other questions that I have not asked previously. Um, Lila Marin Bloom has come up every single month and asking, is there allotment in the budget to provide paraeducators with devices? Not in the existing program. And what is the ratio of PPWs to students currently? Do you know that? So. We have uh, 39.7 PPWs, and I would like to point out that um, the nature of the work of PPWs um, is not a direct uh, ratio. So for example, not all students need support of a PPW. In fact, it's a subgroup. Now the subgroup certainly has um, uh, intense needs, if you will. Uh, I, one of the things that we have discussed at the curriculum committee is the way the role of the school counselor, the social worker, and the PPW work in orchestration. And you see in our budget that we have put forward and requested additional school counselors and social workers because if we front load and do that work up front, there's less need for the PPW work with attendance and residency. 
when, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't continue to invest in PPWs, but it, my goal is for you to understand fully how those roles orchestrate together, and that it's it's not a it, it's not an easy brush, right? All those students need have needs, and there's tiers of intensity, and that in this budget we have put forward to build up the forward resources around school counselors and social workers. Um, and so I know that I just wanted to make sure we have a clear understanding of those roles and how there is overlap, but they orchestrate together. Um, yes, thank you. thank you, I understand that. Um, so you're saying with the increase then in this, the school counselors and, uh, and whatnot, that will lighten the load for the PPWs and they'll be able to concentrate more on attendance and residency? Well, what I would say is that as we build up those services, we will see an impact on the PPWs as well. Again, I, I wouldn't make a broad straight statement that that suddenly will lighten their load. Um, but what it does is it, it allows us to address issues earlier and by other resources. Okay, thank you. And what is the ratio of SROs to students? Is that known? We can provide that for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for school. Do all students regard, okay, I think we've already talked about this, uh, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, now, in the document, that the stat document, it shows that the annual expense going forward is expected to be about $60 million per year. Can you explain what we're getting for that expense? I think it's clearly listed here. We went, I've gone through it. Uh, we're getting- In these categories. Classroom, here. library, staff, student, curriculum, hardware, professional development, um, and the exact dollars amount, dollar amounts. They were roll the implementation costs, the rollout cost. I mean, I took those as being the categories for those initial, you know, uh, there, that two hundred fifty-seven million. There are five years worth of costs. Okay. Those categories are actual real categories of expenditures related to the program. So they, they, they are category costs, but the actual category costs of the components of the STAT rollout. But there's the 60 million ongoing expenses, but there's also other expenses, like when we do a purchase new devices, that's over, that's on top of that, correct? No. No, 60 million is 60 million. It's actually 56.9. Well, for million. 20 for FY19 it's mm -hmm. That's about the 60 ongoing number. Million. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do where do the students turn in the devices at the end of the school year? Yes. Okay. And for the software licenses, then are we, then are we not paying for them during the summer? Or is, you know, how does that work? What is, is it pay per usage? Just most of the licenses year? are annualized and licenses. Okay. Some are, some of the pricing is based on the number of users, and some is a flat amount based okay. on the size of the system. And I know that teachers have some amount of discretion as far as the software programs that they can pick from, and they can also find things that they're interested in online. Is there any, is there a, a expense involved in individual teacher choices as far as what software they're using? I'm not sure I that I can answer that question or that I understand it. I, I think if your question is, are we charged based on teacher selection? I'm not sure I fully understand. No, I mean, there's certain programs that we've said, you know, this is available to you. But right. then they can go online and find other things that they want to use. Some of it's free, mm -hmm. um, but some of it might not be. And I guess they have to get approval for those things. Well, and even the free programs, uh, we have um, a process in place where teachers, if they come across um, 
uh, application or product that they are interested in, they need to submit. We have a process for them to submit that because, again, we want to vet it through our data sharing. We want to ensure that we have strong safety controls. Um, so frankly, while teachers have, you know, we don't want to discourage them if they come across a product that they think is promising. Uh, but what we do is encourage them and expect them to submit that through the proper processes so that we can ensure that, one, we're not picking up a product that replicates or duplicates what we are already paying for. Most importantly, that it is um, compliant with our student data sharing and that uh, it is something that, um, if appropriate, would integrate into our BCPS1. So there is a series of processes that need to be examined. So I hope I answered your question. That's very good. Thank you. Um, and what happens to the devices at the end of their life cycle? Now, we, we're currently purchasing, but our new uh, we're going to start leasing with our new no. RFP, correct? Mm -mm. No. We've always leased devices. Release. And so part of that 32,000 number that I gave you is going to include the very first set of devices that were issued to teachers. Mm -hmm. So those will be refreshed. Um, and then the additional uh, high school devices will be provided in this next year's purchase and they are simply returned to the leasing company okay. we're about an hour into our discussion um, i see mrs han has some questions i see that mr yulefelder and mrs causey have had their hands up again um, so if i may ask you to take a break mrs miller and ask mrs han to ask questions thank you mr chair one quick follow-up to mrs miller's question about the refresh cycle what is the time frame for that refresh cycle for devices it's currently a four-year cycle it's four years. Correct. Okay. Has there been any analysis of the cost implication of reducing that life cycle or discussion with the vendor about possibly reducing that? And the reason I ask is because that seems like an especially a long time with devices that could be um, see some hard use with our students. Um, um, certainly, if that's a follow-up, we can do more research on that. But that's that's part of the four-year leasing agreement related to residual and. The, the turnover, that's, that's sort of the, the industry standard now, but we can certainly look at other options as we explore with that. I would also suggest that whenever we're talking about any type of a refresh, we also have to take into consideration our workforce and our teacher base. So again, whenever we're introducing any type of new equipment, we have to um, be sensitive to the fact that they have to learn that new equipment as well. So if we should go from a four-year refresh to a two-year refresh, then we have to take into consideration that our teachers would have to learn something new every two years. So organiz you know, when we think about systems thinking and organizationally, we have to keep in mind our and be very sensitive to the fact that of our workforce as well. Of course, and it would be the hope that we wouldn't be going from um, to drastically different device at that four-year refresh point that some of the basic um, competencies would carry over to the new device. Mm -hmm. But the Understood. devices are fully warranted for that four-year period. Great. Um, my second question has to do with the overall budget for technology support services. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to see that it's relatively flat given the fact that we are rolling out 32,000 <laughs> um, devices. And is that because those support costs are included with the device leases and we don't need to increase our internal support? Well, um, could you refer me to the number that you're... 211 in the budget book. The increase, I don't have the percentage in front of me, but the increase is relatively small year over year um, for overall um, budget for technology support services. Yep, a part of the lease um, at full implementation provides for up to 89 contracted support staff through the leasing vendor and so um, that's why this number has not fluctuated and the the contracted support staff have increased over the deployment so that the we started out with relatively few and we would reach 89 or so next year under the plan that's associated with the various rollouts from elementary lighthouse to the regular elementary to middle school lighthouse and so as First. the as the program grows we have to have the support to support it yes ma'am. of course and of those 89 do we know how many are being added with the one-to-one -one device rollout 
from high I schools? I don't know, but I can find out for you. I mean, for the final year? Yes. Yeah, I'll, we'll find that out. We'll look. One of the concerns the community has expressed is inadequate support for the students with their, their devices waiting a long time for assistance okay. and repair. So okay. I want to make sure that we're providing adequate support um, given that we're about to embark on a major rollout. Mm -hmm. um, another question which may require follow-up and I'll, I'm happy to submit this in writing is do you have the breakdown of those lease charges, um, device costs, support costs, how I'm, I'm coming up with a number of 1593 approximately per device, which is relatively I, I close to the I think that's in the right range, range, including, yeah, the warranty, the support, um, et cetera, yeah. Would you be able to provide uh, yeah. the breakdown of those uh -huh. costs? And Just percentage so we make sure we fine. have the questions right, can you, can you guys submit specifically so we can make sure we address your specific question? We're, we're taking notes, but we're going to make sure we don't miss anything in that discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. That concludes my questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone before we go back to Mrs. Causey and Mr. Yulfelder? All right. Mr. Yulfelder, then Mrs. Causey. I have a general question. Um, my experience in the past when budgets are presented to the county executive, um, there was a time when the, uh, the BCPS did not have the opportunity uh, to change things around in terms of if, if the county executive uh, supported uh, a uh, smaller number than our submission, uh, usually they decided what category got hit. And um, I, I think in, in the past administration, we've sort of, I want to make sure we bypass that, that, that we'll make the determination of, of <laughs> somebody's laughing over there. <laughs> The, uh, He's making, you know, the reallocation based on either an increase, which I doubt, or a cut. They, the, uh, when, when county government, uh, we give them right. the line items in their accounting system so we convert this so they can see what it looks like in their system. And they will sometimes ask about changes they want to make and can and where where are those dollars um, but they typically set the category budgets they'll ask us for programmatic information and then they'll take that information and adjust the budget accordingly but I think their primary concern is the bottom line more so than which of the 13 activities the budget is in. Doesn't a budget transfer require county council approval? Yes. All right. And, and board approval. I got and, one other right. question. Um, has anybody taken the time? The way I look at it is real quickly, we're spending a little less than $500, $500 per, per uh, student for the stat program for that $56 million. How does that, does that compare? Do we have ability to compare that with other urban uh, school systems to see what their costs are. I, I know about Broward County, I know about Los Angeles County, but I know since we initiated this back five, year, five years ago, uh, more school systems have uh, gone into the, a similar program. I'm just wondering if there are any statistics published um, that, that tell you per student what the, the expenditures are. There's certainly other statistics, but um, I think the key factor there is the type and nature of the rollout at each individual LEA. It may not look and be the same, so the comparison is hard to do school over school district over school district because of the varying degrees of um, uh, implementation, programs, uh, and all of that. So um, you'd have to find the peer group that falls within your peer group and do that, but. Thank you. This is Causey, uh, and before you begin, it's about eight, 37 about um, and we have um, a little discussion around the table and we've allocated until 845 so just want to tell you thank you mr. chair um, and I just wanted as a final question to it's just one big question <laughs> thank you thank you mr. Smith sure. um, thank you mr. chair um, I did just have a couple questions and I don't need the answers here but just if they can be submitted. But I did want to ask because we have uh, had a number of key stakeholders 
send us information, and I just wanted to understand that it uh, received the attention of you, Ms. White, and your staff. We received a letter from TABCO from Abby Baton talking about um, that they support the people for the people, and they're especially grateful for the positions of ESOL, special educators, social workers, nurses, et cetera. Um, but then they are still questioning um, that all of these benefits and these positions that we desperately need do not make up for the missing 200 teachers. So I'm wondering, number one, did you receive these? I, I think I forwarded them. Um, and, and are they going to be addressed? The yeah, I've comments? actually had um, some direct conversation with Ms. Baden uh, directly. So again, we're talking about um, several years. It's not just about the recovery of those positions. It's also about the recruitment in, in particular um, areas. It's also about space. It's also about um, uh, staffing adjustments as well. So again, you're talking about um, positions from two administrations ago. Uh, and so to recover those positions will require kind of a multi-year plan and a phase in after some data analysis has been conducted so that we can determine where those needs are um, and where we can address those needs. So yes, I'm aware of Ms. Baden's request. And um, I just wanted to go harken back to your first question about teacher salaries, because again, and now just um, ask Dr. Mayo just to do a little quick math here, but we can certainly follow up. Um, and Dr. Mayo, you can uh, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we factor in each district, it looks like the average is about $46,000 a year to starting teacher salaries. Baltimore County Public Schools were just a little um, under $47,000 a year. Montgomery County, if we look at the um, at, at three other districts who are above us, Montgomery County is at 49. Howard is just over 47, so close to where we are, and uh, PG is just over 47, again, close to where we are as well. So, you know, again, I just wanted to put that out there and just say that we'll take a look at the document and we'll look, we'll um, do some follow up on that just to make sure that we are moving in the right direction. I appreciate your comments. Um, because when we're talking about teacher recruitment, definitely the teachers will be able to tell us what, <laughs> yeah. what district to district uh, differences there are. Uh, we also received um, information from uh, Ms. Jean Suda, also related to teacher staffing, um, and I just wanted to make sure that um, that, that was responded to. Um, also, we had a number of people come and talk to us about the uh, Baltimore County Infants and Toddlers and Special Education Citizens Advisory Council, um, and also the um, Gifted and Talented. Um, they came and supported the increases, but the one question I did have is when I was looking back in time through the budget book, is at one point we had 11 uh, members of staff in the Gifted and Talented office, and now we have three and we're adding three. So that's still, again, a, a lag in what we had and we have more students. And we're also trying to increase access to underrepresented groups uh, for gifted and talented and advanced academic programs. So I was just wondering if you could have a response to that in the next packet of information in terms of where and when we can look at that. That's on uh, page eight. Uh, question seven, seven Which group? Two. in set two. In set two. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And Ms. Causey, um, when you sent the message about other stakeholders that send us messages, sometimes their, their response was um, very closely related to some of the questions of board members. So in the essence of time and the volume that we have, we, we tried to refine that. So. Uh, we, we can confirm that just about every question that came from those stakeholders were included in either your questions or Ms. Miller's questions, so we didn't, we didn't feel like we needed to cut and paste it on another line item. We tried to do it all inclusively, trying to make sure we refined the questions because we didn't want it to be confusing to the public when they go through these two documents. This is a pretty Herculean task to go through these documents, so we didn't want it to be more pages. That's the, that's the piece that takes so long for us. We have to read all the questions and say, are there three questions talking about this and are they three separate questions? If they're three similar questions, we, we sort of make sure the responses are consistent with each other. 
Thank you. I really do appreciate that. And I would just point out to anyone who's still watching that they can certainly go online and see if their question got answered. Um, and, and hopefully it would because you have sent us a great deal of information. So I do appreciate that and I appreciate all the work that you've done. Thanks. So, um, so this has been um, a, a good work session. Mr. Hayden. I would like to reiterate a point that I've made earlier. Uh, I'll let my 350 questions wait for later. But the point that I made later uh, earlier that I think is very important and could streamline this process mm -hmm. if we reestablish the board budget committee because experience that I had in there over 12 budget cycles, uh, well, 16 if you count on the other side, mm -hmm. uh, found that that made things much more efficient Questions were handled quicker, mm -hmm. and we didn't get caught in this pell-mell rush to get to the end, which is always a position where you are waiting for errors to occur that you find later. Thank Very you. Good. So we have, uh, well, I'll ask Ms. Decker to send out an email to everyone reminding you that uh, uh, by midnight Sunday night, more questions can uh, be delivered to um, the administration. Mr. Uh, Chair, if yes. I may. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to just take a moment to thank our team. Again, this um, staff is such a hardworking staff, and so thank you to Mr. Smith, Mr. Saris, also to Dr. McComas, but to also everyone else, um, those who are in the room and those who are not in the room. Uh, we've had staff working over the weekends and spending very long hours to make sure that we are responsive to the board and to the public as well. So thank you for your efforts, and I'm excited about this budget. I, I said so before, I have to say it again, uh, this, um, this budget is about people and because we are in a people business. And so I'm excited about um, proposing people for our people. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Mrs. Miller. Just one quickie. I just wanted to be sure that the questions that we had submitted that didn't get answered because of time constraints, that you'll continue to answer those in this next round. Uh, clarify that for us. Whatever we had already submitted that didn't get responded to. Everything that we received um, in both groups. Uh, I, th I think what Mr. Smith has said is he has tried to meld some that were similar in question, so he may not, if there were 150 questions, there might only be 130 answers because there were some that were okay, So you're saying similar. you answered them all? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Okay, so... Um, this is a work session, so it's not an opportunity to make motions, uh, but since we have time between now and the next meeting, uh, February 6th, to think about the budget, and I know many of you around uh, the dais have uh, thought about things that you might want the rest of the board to think about in terms of, uh, of potential uh, changes. I'd like to just go around, maybe starting with Mr. Young, to just if you all have things you want to identify that we can think about. No need to, no need to ask for a second. Obviously, uh, no need to really argue in support of um, of the suggestions, but instead just to kind of air them so we have an opportunity to think about them instead of being surprised at the next meeting. Thank you. Um, I guess what I would like to see, part of it is coming from a lot of the community feedback, is what it would take to add, you know, um, at least five PPWs and five residency liaisons. All right. Uh, Ms. Eaton? I was going to say the same thing as Mr. Young. Okay. Mr. Virch? Thank you, Ed, and thanks for the opportunity to do this. I've got a couple of things I've been researching, but I'd just reserve if I could. Sure. Thank you, Ed. I, don't, I forget whether Ms. Schaefer participates in this or not. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, What's that? She can ask questions. She I just can can't ask vote. Questions. Right. That's what. Can vote. Opinion. Oh, absolutely. That's fine. Yep. Um, I just like to echo what Ms. Eaton and Mr. Young said. Thanks. Well, I think there's a lot of consensus then around that issue because I would share that. However, uh, I will also add that before you members and also in your inboxes is a position description for a position that you all may be familiar with due to our experience uh, last time around involving workforce development and a coordinator or quarterback position. 
uh, it's been fleshed out a little bit more, as you will see, than last time around with the able assistance of Doug Handy uh, and our folks over at Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, I think there is a general consensus of the value add that this position provides, uh, and I am hopeful that we are going to be able to articulate that with our economic uh, development folks and our county government, um, and I'd ask for your consideration of same. Thanks. Mr. Yulfader. Thank you. Um, I, 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 what the one thing I think is really important is that uh, this budget has been shared uh, with the county executive and, and I'm sure with other members of the county council uh, because sometimes uh, in the past budgets have been prepared and they so-called come to a shock. Uh, at the county executive level, and, and it, it starts a, a, a nasty uh, set of circumstances where cuts are made and so forth. But I, I am glad that the, the county revenues, uh, based on the projections that I last saw, uh, are on the uptick, and I'm hoping that because the uh, county ta taxes are on the uptick, uh, property taxes will produce more because of higher assessments, because of values, that I'm hoping that the uh, county executive and the county council will accept this budget uh, with the 7% increase in MOE. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say there wasn't uh, much discussion, but it is certainly on the radar um, of the facilities and um, uh, budgets related to keeping our school uh, buildings and facilities safe and functioning at a high level for our students and also transportation, um, which has been um, an ongoing issue and we were not able to have our transportation report, so we're still in a bit of uh, an unknown territory in terms of the improvements that we're making and what next level of improvements we remain to be made. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that we do have improvements that can be made. So. Um, and the other thing is just I'll be looking closely at our requests for additional people to support our people based on the input from our key stakeholders <coughs> around teachers um, and then the support personnel. I appreciate Dr. McComas speaking to the uh, interactions and the synergies between the counselors, the psychologists, and the PPWs and other support. So um, I will be looking at that. Uh, we have gotten a uh, the full board has received uh, from Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell, who works a lot with uh, some of the needy in our community um, around those issues. So we'll be, I'll be taking a look at that. This is him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be looking to make three motions to this budget to amend to add funding for approximately 20 PPWs, um, such that we have a dedicated PPW for each high school. Um, hopefully we can phase in additional PPWs in future years so that middle and elementary schools have that dedicated support also. Um, my second motion will be to request funding for an independent third-party review of board discipline policies and practices. I'm looking for guidance in terms of a number to add to the budget for that. My third motion will be to support an independent review of BCPS residency verification policies, practices, and enforcement. And I'm also looking for guidance in terms of a budgetary number for that review. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Miller. Um, I, I'm focusing on uh, what we can do with regard to STAT, um, also providing devices for paraeducators, and I'm very concerned about the school-based budgets and how they've been uh, shrunk. Um, and, and I would like to suggest to anyone wanting to add something to the budget that they think about maybe where we can take it from rather than just expanding our request. Um, I think we've got some room perhaps in administration overhead or somewhere else where we could identify that we could take from there. I think we're more likely than to get our requests approved um, by the county council if we do it that way. Great, Mr. Hayden. The words that um, really hit me through um, the comments tonight, I mean, hit me heavily, heavily, let me get the word out, uh, were a violence, safety, bullying, mocking, which related to lack of training perhaps, lack of staff, 
but I believe that before we do anything else in this system, we have to make it safe. And anyone who believes we can put the safety part off and do some of these other things, no matter how important they might be, first, I think it's time they wake up and realize that we have to make this system safe. And at the same time, uh, echoing what Ms. Miller just said, uh, the opportunity uh, and responsibility, as it were, in board members to look through a budget to say, not only are we asking for more, but perhaps could, could we be a little more frugal in some spots? And if we don't do that, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Thank you. Very good. Next on our agenda is a board member committee report. Uh, and the first one is the Audit Committee. Mr. Yulfelder. And Mr. Stewart, Building and Contracts. So Building and Contracts will be meeting February 6th. Mm, let's see, who's Mr. McDaniels in here for curriculum? Mr. Virch. Um, thank you, Ed. Um, on behalf of the uh, members of the Policy Review Committee, I uh, gently remind everyone, including uh, all of our stakeholders, that the policies presented for first reader on tonight's agenda will be available for comment on our board's policy website. We all encourage members of uh, the public or stakeholders to submit their comments uh, to these policies online or by uh, other means. Board members are also uh, welcome to use our website to submit uh, their most welcome comments and suggestions. The committee's next meeting will be February 12th. Very good. Is there, a, is there any curriculum update? Uh, and it doesn't need to be. I just want to make Josie? Ms. Schaefer. We met last Thursday, and we had three really interesting PowerPoints. They were about um, different math programs we can use in elementary, middle, and high school, and then on the digital database that we use when you open BCPS1, and then an update on culture and climate. Very good. Thank you. Um, and how about digital safety? Mrs. Miller. Uh, I don't have anything new. We're just waiting for responses from previous uh, requests, and uh, if anybody else has something to add to that. Very good. Thanks very much to everyone. Um, our next board meeting is Tuesday, February 6th. We're adjourned. <laughs>